Well, uh, Matthew 6, verse 9, that's our text, our Lord, the Lord's Prayer text. Uh, and the title is God's Kingdom, His Will on Earth. See, I believe God's will on earth is His kingdom on earth. This is His will. When we get this, and Carol knows I struggle with this sermon this week. Uh, I did a lot of extra time because God was speaking into my heart about that very thing. We're always looking for His will to be done in our lives, but God's will is his kingdom to be established and flourish in this earth. That is his will. And when his will, when we say thy will be done, we follow it up with on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus spent much of his ministry trying to explain to those who were closest to him and to others about the kingdom of God. So this is very important this morning, and I I want you to really dig in with me here and get it. Here's what Matthew 6, 9 says. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Most of us know that by memory. So if I ask you the question today, what is the kingdom of God? I wonder what you would answer. Or or maybe I ask you, what does it mean to be a kingdom person? A person of the kingdom of God? What would you say? A lot of people would answer, well, that means that I'm saved. And when I die, I go to heaven. To go to God's kingdom. Well, yes, in a way that is God's kingdom, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. Not at all what he was trying to explain to those who were listening, but they just didn't get it. I think a lot of Christians think that way today. Well, I got saved, so one day I'll be in the kingdom of heaven. No, that's not God's plan. That's not his will. His will is here and now. Matthew six thirty three says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things shall be added to you. What did he say to seek? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And I believe this is a present tense promise. Those things, we always think of it as stuff, but God's talking about kingdom and righteousness. Those things, the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God will be added to you now, here in this life, on this earth. But do we really know what the kingdom of God is? Are we, are we clear on that? Have we, do we have that? It's, it's the rule and authority. Here's what a kingdom is. Kingdom of God's God's rule and authority over this sphere and the influence that it has. And one preacher explained it this way. He said, in the kingdom of God, I found something far superior to personal fulfillment. See, a lot of people want the kingdom of God working in their lives because they want it to satisfy what they want. But the kingdom of God's not about that. He said, I have found the heart of God in the search for the kingdom of God. And I've found my reason for being here on this earth. This is important, folks. I believe the kingdom's sheer immensity removes all limits on what God wants to do and can do in our lives. But only when we attach ourselves and dig into this kingdom principle. So think for a moment what I said. I I said the kingdom's sheer immensity, the, the vastness of it all, removes the limits on what God wants to do and can do in and through us. God wants us to see it so big. He wants to see it the way he sees it. He wants to know us to know it the way he knows it. This is what Jesus kept trying to say. It sounds to me like Mark 9, 23, doesn't it? All things are possible to him that believes. That means all things. That means everything. That means immensity. That means the vastness of God's kingdom can come into us. The kingdom of God is big, far beyond our wildest imaginations or dreams. What God wants us to understand is the fullness of God's kingdom can never be attained, not on this earth. We, we won't understand it all. It's, its resources are never depleted. Its season never ends. This kingdom of God is so vast and so complete and so huge and, and, and so beyond what we know that we just keep learning day by day. That's why we stay in the word. When you're living in the kingdom of God, you never get the feeling that, oh, I've seen this before. 
No, no, no. When you're in the kingdom of God, you're amazed at what God does the next time you go on your knees, the next time you begin claiming, the next time you're reading and the promises of God become real to you and new vistas are opened up and the Bible as it's written in layers, another layer is revealed. You've read the scripture 20 times before, but on that day, the revelation of God comes into your spirit. That's the kingdom of God at work in you. It's the will of God being done in your life. Look, What God wants is for us to know what truly ignites his heart. He wants us to know what thrills him. He wants us to know and to be and to do those things that causes him to clap his hands and say, Yay, they got it. Yes, they're getting it. Yes, did you hear that prayer they prayed? Did you you see what they did in that church? They're getting it. It's becoming real to them. But I got to warn you, anytime we open ourselves up to the kingdom principles and start living by it, the enemy is going to come and attack you as forcefully as he can. So get ready. When you move forward into the things of God, the devil is going to try to throw everything he can at you to make you stumble and fall and think it's foolish and idiotic and crazy. But it's up to you and me to press on and to realize what's happening. He tries to counteract your zeal and you're discovering God's fullness. He wants to weaken your hunger for change. He doesn't want you to keep moving forward. And anything he can throw in your way, physical, financial, uh, uh, relational, he will throw in your way and try to weaken you and to destroy it. And maybe some of you right now feel too weak and empty. Maybe Maybe you've struggled so much that you feel like, I don't have anything for God to work with. Well, that's okay for the moment. Just keep listening to me. I'm going to challenge you today to take a step beyond where you are. See, God's kingdom, when that principle becomes alive in you, it will produce new growth in you. It's like a plant. Carol had a plant out here, a little pine tree that just uh, didn't do very well. And it kept dying back and dying back. And it was like, you know, it just, it couldn't work and couldn't live. Well, they had to trim a bunch of stuff off. And now it's got one little nice shoot on it. You know what? It's going to be fine because there's going to be growth that's going to happen. There's going to be new limbs come. There's going to be new bright green springtime kind of attitude in that. You watch and see that little pine tree is going to be wonderful. But they had to cut a bunch of stuff out first to get rid of the old, dead, dry, ugly. And in the kingdom principles of God, you may feel like you're getting whittled down and you feel like you've you're getting things that are, that are no longer growing and no longer beautiful and your life is ugly and things haven't happened like you wanted them to and it just doesn't work. What God's trying to say to you is let me do my work, my kingdom work in you. Let me cut away those things that are not productive. Let me cut away those things that you felt were so important that have proved to be unimportant in the scope of the kingdom of God. The Bible's filled with examples of men and women at their thirstiest, when God met them, where they were, as they were, for who they were, and filled them with himself and used them, whatever situation you're in right now, no matter how you feel about your circumstance, no matter how you feel about your situation, now is the time to ask God to help you become a kingdom person for the kingdom to begin living in you and to pray, thy kingdom come in me. Say with me, Lord Help me me. to be a person person. of the kingdom. kingdom. When you become that person, you will find what ignites the heart of God and you will be ignited by the same things. The problem is we're ignited by entertainment or we're ignited by, uh, by sports or we're ignited by relationships, but that's not always what ignites the heart of God. And kingdom life says, I'm gonna love what God loves. I'm gonna fulfill my life by fulfilling what his plan is for me. It's not about what I want any longer. It's about what he wants for me and what he wants to do in me. Lord, make me a kingdom person. Make me a person that's after your heart. That happens, you'll become an acre of heaven here on earth. Do you hear that? All of a sudden, when you become a part of the kingdom, then your acre becomes a part of heaven and you've established it on earth. 
You know, in the uh, days when they were uh, developing the West, people would go out and stake a claim. You know, they would drive four stakes, and that's their territory. And they would claim it for themselves, and they, w- they would claim it, and they'd build a house on it, and they'd put their cattle on it, and it was their property, and that's what the government had said we could do. And this is what we need to do in this world for Christ. We need to say, I'm going to stake four corners And this is my acre of the kingdom of God in this life. And I'm going to live in the kingdom. I'm going to speak for the kingdom. I'm going to work for the kingdom. Because this is not my domain. This is God's domain. This is his house. This is his place. This is his life. But we think we're living in somebody else's domain all the time, don't we? We think we're living in the Senate's domain or the Congress domain or Mr. Obama's domain or someone else's domain or your bosses or the people who own your house in, in the earthly title and deed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about establishing a kingdom place for God to move and work. That's his will. That's why thy kingdom come is important. Thy will be done on earth. My acre, my farm is God's, and I establish it, and I speak his words from it, and it is his place, and it will continue to be his place. This is my kingdom. That's what God's saying. The more we do that, the more we take back from the enemy. But it's when we have the wrong idea about it all, and we're saying, well, I'll never have anything, and I guess God can't use me because of my failures and my past. Or God can't use me because I don't have anything. Stop it. Stop it. You have the checkbook to heaven. You are a joint heir. You know what that means, don't you? Anybody here got a joint checking account with your husband or your wife or your children or somebody? Got one? That's what it means. You can write a check too. What did Jesus write checks on? The bank of heaven. What can you write a check on? Are you a joint heir with Jesus? On the bank of heaven. This is what we have to understand. Whatever God has, we has. It's provided at the cross through Jesus, and we are his children. It is done. Look, Jesus kept telling them, pray big prayers. Expect big things. Expect more. Mark 23 again. Jesus said unto them, if you can believe all things are possible. You know, there's a big if there. If you can believe what my words say. If you can believe who God is, if you can believe that this kingdom can come in you, then you can ask whatever you will. And all things are possible to him who believes in what I've been telling you. So much of the time we just pray details. We don't have a big picture at all. Not that details don't matter. They do. I mean, the little stuff matters. Yes. But our vision is sometimes limited by our experience or lack thereof. I'm not going to go back very deep into this elephant story, but once again, let me tell you, if I've never seen an elephant, I can't believe for an elephant. If I've never heard about an elephant, if I don't know what an elephant is, if I don't know what it looks like, I can't get a mental picture and believe that God could send me an elephant if I believe for it once I know what it is. But if you don't know what it is, I'm trying to open your eyes and a vista in you to see what the kingdom is. This is like the elephant that God's sending you, but it's the kingdom of God. I want you to see what it is. It's you and God connected in such a way that there is a connection that can't be broken and that it is so powerful that it affects those around you. And not only your acres affected, but all the acres that touch your acre are affected and all the acres that touch that acre are affected. It's an expanding process of the kingdom. Glory to God. When our vision is enlarged and we see the fullness of what God wants to do, if we truly want to honor God and we believe what he says and we act on that belief by praying big prayers with big faith, God is a big God, big enough to do whatever you believe for. That's what he just said. He is an almighty God who cannot lie. And if he promised it, he will answer those prayers. It's, it's as if God himself is saying, ask me for something that's so big, see if I want to answer you. The windows of heaven, pour me out a blessing, not big enough to receive. What does that mean? Well, it means you praying big. Ask me to send my kingdom to the earth through you and see if I won't complete that. Try me and see. Just, just test and see if you can't live a kingdom life in the middle of a world who has no, no idea of what you're talking about. That's okay. You can inform them. You can teach them. It's a lot bigger than asking God to give you a good time on your vacation in Florida, see, or to bless your cousin Sally 
or to tell what you need to, to do for lunch today and where you need to go. I'm talking about big prayers. I'm talking about things that are beyond logic and reason. I'm talking about things that are so big that there's no way you could complete it if you did it on your own. This is where God wants us to live. The changing, life-changing power of the Lord's prayer is here. It's clear that Jesus talked about big things when he spoke about the kingdom of God, and they weren't getting it. Kingdom is an area or a sphere of control. The kingdom is the place that you have arranged to suit your purposes and your values. It's an environment that's arranged according how you like it. This is what God's kingdom is. When you become a kingdom person, you attach yourself to God's like, to God's place, to God's desires. Okay, let's say, uh, let's talk about environment and sphere of control and kingdoms. Let's say my truck, my, my pickup is my kingdom and I arrange it to suit me. And I've got my seat set just right. I've got my mirrors adjusted the way I like them. And I tune my radio to the stations I like. And my air conditioner set the way I like it. And those things are turned just where I want it. It's my domain. It's my kingdom. Got it? It's my kingdom. And Carol's got a car. It's her kingdom. And drives her crazy when I move the driver's seat and don't put it back. <laughs> Change her mirrors. My pickup's my kingdom. Carol's car is her kingdom. Hands off. The way we like it. Same when we travel. You know, we traveled for 25 years of our life. Go into a hotel room and we change the environment. We, we make it our kingdom. I mean, ca- travel can be chaotic. It can wear you down. Now you say, oh, no, I love vacation. I'm not talking about vacation. I'm talking about being on the road every week in a different place, every night, sleeping in a different bed, in a different room, in a different location. It gets to be where that's not fun anymore. 25 years of it. But when we go into a room, we create our own environment. We create a kingdom. And the hand towel is on the counter in the right place. Night lights in the bathroom. My razor, my toothbrush, my comb on the counter just the way I like it. Our personal pillows that we take with us. How many old people are here like that? <laughs> are placed on the correct side of the bed. How many know you've got to sleep on the right side? Okay, I'm, I'm, you're with me. And Carol arranges all the parts to her morning face on the desk (laughs) to be artistically applied after coffee. You know what I'm talking about. That's the way we like it. It it suits our personalities. We arrange the environment the way we like it. It becomes our temporary kingdom. So a kingdom is one's sphere of control. It's, It's what you can do in the area where you are established as the ruler. So what is God's sphere of authority? What is his kingdom? You ask 10 different theologians, you get 10 different answers. One definition of the kingdom of God is God's rule and authority over any domain or sphere of influence. Like say, my heart. Hmm. So could God's kingdom be in my heart? That's what Jesus kept trying to say again and again and again. They wanted, they wanted military. They wanted war. They wanted to take over the Roman Empire. And Jesus kept saying, you don't understand. The kingdom is not about taking over the government. Listen to me now. I'd like to. <laughs> Wouldn't hurt my feelings any. But it's about our hearts. I mean, they were living, Jesus living under Roman rule could not have been fun. And yet he did it. It was his purpose for coming to show us how this kingdom could be different. I mean, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy kingdom, thy will, it all connects. That's serious business. I mean, you're asking God to invade your world and transform it when you pray that prayer. Lord, See, people pray the Lord's Prayer. They don't even think what it says. They don't know what they've said. They go right through it, and it's just, it's just another quotation like the Pledge of Allegiance or something that they have learned from the time they were small children. They have no idea what they're saying. This is serious business. To pray this way means we're not satisfied with the status quo, that things have to change, and we've got to pray big prayers because we know, that this, we know that things can be better. We know that it does not have to stay the same way it is. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the kingdom of God coming. And the difficulty is seen because it, it, we lay it out in a series of logical statements. We understand it better. Look, look at this with me. God has a will concerning my life, okay? 
God has a will, number one. And God's will encompasses his desires for my life. So if it's God's will, if it's his kingdom, and I'm praying, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then I submit to his will, not mine. I give up my will for his. And then third, I also have a will that encompasses my desires for my life. So God has a will concerning my life. He has a will about the desires of my life. And I have a will about the desires of my life. And those wills, not always, but very often are in conflict. What I want is not always what God wants for me. Anybody ever been there? Run into that same buzzsaw? I want what I want. And I want to do it my way. And God's saying, I got a will for you too. And you're saying, yeah, but God, that's not what I want to do right now. So when there's conflict, either God's will will prevail or my will will prevail. And when I pray your will be done, I'm asking that God's will prevail in my life, that his kingdom show up in my life and that his will take over everything I'm involved in. That's the basic difficulty when we pray this prayer, if we really pray it. So you can say all kinds of words, but you haven't prayed until you pray this in faith. I mean, no, the prayer of faith makes the difference. Prayer of faith is what changes things. When we ask that God's will be done, you're implicitly asking that God overturns your will. I don't know if you've ever been in a a place. I've never been in a, a judge's chambers where they read a will. But you know that in some cases, a judge can overturn the will that's written and impose his will on that very thing. I've never been in that situation. But wouldn't that be a disturbing thing for people who have, who know what the will is, the earthly will, and yet the judge imposes what he wants in that situation? When I think about that, I think about if our will is overturned, what do we do then? Well, when we pray that his will be done, we're sometimes so oblivious to what it means. We ask God for guidance. He guides us, but it's not where we want to go. And we, re- we rebel and we pray for wisdom and we don't like the wisdom because the wisdom seems like nonsense. It doesn't seem like it could ever work out. So we rebel against that. We pray for patience and the answer means trouble for us if we get patience and we want patience right now and we don't want to wait on it. I mean, know that. So we pray on earth as it is in heaven, your will be done, your kingdom come in me, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is God's will being done in heaven? I mean, in heaven, his will is always done. (laughs) Do you believe that? Well, if we pray this prayer and his will comes into me through his kingdom and through those principles, then is not it essential that his will always be done in me? I think so. And his will in heaven is done instantaneously. It is completely done. It is joyfully done. So when you know that God is speaking to you and when you know that God is leading you and when we pray on earth as it is in heaven, this earth, if we allow it to, will become a little more like heaven as we pray this prayer. But that seems to rarely happen on earth. Have you noticed? We are so obstinate and stubborn and uh, ugly with God. And we don't even realize it sometimes. We just, we just become obstinate and we just, we we're immovable. God's will is rarely done on earth because there's over 6 billion wills on earth and only one in heaven. So God's got a battle on his hands, doesn't he? To get his will imposed here on earth. And it's up to us. See, there's still only one perfect will in heaven. It's his. And there's six billion will, wills here on this earth. So what do we do about it? We start with me. I start with me. I don't worry about you, whether you're in God's will or not. I try to teach you that it, it's, it's possible and it should be done. But when you look around you do, you, do you see God's will being done here on earth? Do you really see it? I mean, when you think about it, I mean, pick up the newspaper, another school shooting uh, or a church shooting. Uh, you, you read about powerful people in, in our world uh, evading taxes and getting away with it, rising tension in Israel and Iran and the Middle East. And 
Our papers have been full in recent years of sexual misdeeds by top elected officials. Or, or just this last week, uh, you pick up the paper and you read about a, a school teacher who uh, was charged with sexual battery against a 16-year-old student in his class. And you go, what? Thy will be done? Is this your will, Lord? No, somebody else's will is being done, folks. Too much of the time in our world today. And rarely do we really mean when we pray it, even in our own Christian lives, thy will be done. Too much of the time we're saying thy will be done if it matches up with what my will wants to be done. If I can can do what I want and have your will, then that's great. Otherwise, I think I'll do it my way. Hmm. It's a tough prayer to pray in sincerity because it means you give up control of your life. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Hmm. You willing to give up control? You willing to say, Lord, I don't care what it costs me? God has a will. He has a desire for your life. And you have a will, a desire for your life. And you're asking God when you pray that prayer to take your will away. I don't want any will anymore, Lord. I simply want to live by yours. I don't want to make any decisions that are apart from you. I don't want to create anything in this world today that's not committed to you where your kingdom has come into my acre of this earth that has become God's acre and I give myself to you totally and completely. Either he's in control or you're in control. You can't both be in control. Did you know that? I mean, no, there's only one head. One head. Not easy to pray like that. Not easy to give up control. Not easily to say, I, I think I want to do what God wants me to do. God's will, seldom done on earth. There are a lot of things in this life today that are obviously not God's will. I mean, you think about the rising tide of unborn babies being killed. A million, over a million a year here in this country alone. I don't believe homosexuality, homosexuality is God's will. I love the homosexual people. But they need to know that, that this is God's plan for them to have to have a different lifestyle. And please don't misunderstand me. So I, I preached this a while back and some fellow said, I'm not coming back there again because uh, we're supposed to love the homosexuals. Yes, we are and we do. I want, I want to tell you this. If you sit here today and you struggle with that, God can set you free. God will, God will help you. God will mend your broken heart and the trouble that you've had. It is not, as I read the word, And I can only go by the word. I'm not preaching Gary here. I'm preaching word. Go to Romans 1 and start reading. You'll find that not God's will. You go to Sodom and Gomorrah, you find it's not God's will. That that this is not the lifestyle that God has chosen for people to live. And it's not uh, not that you're born that way. It's that you are taught. We love the alcoholics. We don't like what they do. We like the drug addicts. We love them. But we don't like what they do. We don't like adulterers pornographer, folks who are caught up in those things, but we love the person. It's the same in every way. I want you to understand that. Don't take me wrong here. I mean, I believe in this world today, the rising tide of divorce is not God's will. I mean, it's just not. And I know know some people struggle with that. Single moms raising children are not God's will. God wants families. God, God established the family and the church. God wants us to be together. Pastors committing adultery is not God's will. Uh, pornography in our, in our, that's rampant in our world today is not God's will. Ethnic cleansing in countries of the world is not God's will. Racial prejudice, not God's will. Same-sex marriage, not God's will. Serial killings, not God's will. Greed, graft, and corruption at the highest places in government and business, not God's will. Sometimes it seems as, as if God has gone to sleep and Satan's taken over. You know why? Because thy kingdom hasn't come in us. There's not enough God's acres here. We've allowed Satan to take control. And we've, we've been the ones that are asleep. God's not asleep, but we are. And we refuse to stand up and say, this can't be. This is not the will of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You've got to realize God does not accept the status quo even when we do. It's still against his will. And he'll bring judgment on those who say, well, whatever happens is okay. Whatever, whatever you believe is okay. No, no, no. That's idol worship. We're worshiping the idol of acceptance and, and uh, political correctness and the idol of uh, 
of receiving whatever comes into our world. That's what Israel did. And God judged them over and over again. And we will be judged for not standing up and letting the kingdom come in us. God's against the status quo. God's against the status quo. He does not accept Satan's takeover of this world. Not since Jesus came. Adam gave it up, turned it over to Satan. Jesus came and took it back. The problem is that we have not aligned ourselves with the right forces. He does not accept that sin should reign in this earth. This is not God's plan. He does not sit idly by while the world goes to hell. He, he sent his prophets and thundered the message over and over again to ancient Israel. He inspired the prophets to write the words that we read in the Bible. I want you to know praying your will be done means trusting God to do his will in your life. That means giving up your own thoughts and ideas and taking on God's. So the biggest question is not, is there a God? The biggest question is, is there a God that cares for me? Is there a God that cares where I am? Is there a God who knows my name? Is there a God who wants me to be a part of his kingdom? Even people who never come to church agree with the fact, I mean, I think it's 94% of people in America believe there is a God. But that's not the same as believing that there's a God that's involved in your daily life, who cares for you, who loves you, who sent his son to die on a cross for you. See, yeah, people, people, are, people are interested in that part. Does God really care for me? I mean, does God feel my pain? Is he interested in me? Does he see my struggle? Does he care what happens to me? Yes, there's a God who cares for you. Yes, there's a God who wants to be involved in your life. So how do you pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How do you pray that from your heart when you're not sure there's a God that cares about you? Why would you want to pray that prayer? If you knew that he had your best interest at heart, then you might dare pray that prayer and pray that way. As long as you doubt, that prayer is almost impossible to pray in sincerity. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 26, 39, Jesus said this. There's a moment in the life of Jesus when he saw the, the cup that he was about to drink filled with the dregs of human scum. And he faced it as the human being that he was. And Matthew 26, 39 says, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Your will, not mine, be done. This is what he prayed. Those are, words, those are not words of unbelief. Those are words of faith. Let me tell you how. They're words of a man who understood fully what it would cost him to do the will of God. See, that's the problem with most of us. We don't want to do the will of God because it's costly. It costs us sacrifice. It costs us our time. It costs us our energies. It costs us our finances. It costs us our life. Did Jesus, was he not clear when he said, if you follow me, take up the cross, lay down your life, follow me. This is why we don't pray it. He didn't pray it because he wished to be released from the will of God. He came to earth knowing that he'd have to pay this price, willing. But in the horror of seeing what it was going to cost him, he asked that it might be removed from him, knowing full well that it would not. So that's the side of humanity and the side of God's kingdom living in us. That's the struggle that we all have on a daily basis. Who's going to win, my humanness, my flesh, or God's kingdom in me? That's the fight. That's the fight. If Jesus struggled with the will of God, don't you think that we will? I mean, here he was facing death at a cross. And it was difficult for him to pray your will be done because he knew what it would cost him. But God doesn't accept the status quo. God sent Jesus to change things, to stir things up, to make it different. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. God sent Jesus to change the kingdoms of this world and to take it back from Satan. There's a lot of answers to this question. A lot of answers to the question, does God care about me? Is he involved in my life? There's only one answer that really matters. 2,000 years ago, a man hung on a cross, gave his life for us. God sent his own son into the world to die for you, for me. Not accepting the status quo, God said, this has got to be different. Something's got to change. What the prophets couldn't accomplish with their words, the son accomplished with the incarnation. 
At Bethlehem, God sent a message to the world. He was saying, things aren't okay on planet Earth. No more status quo. I'm getting involved, and I'm getting involved in a way that you can't ignore. I'm going to get involved in a way that you have to hold me and touch me and hear me and see me. I'm coming to Earth to get involved in your life. I'm invading Earth because I'm coming. Small town of Nazareth in Galilee. Preached in the synagogues at the beginning of his ministry. Went from village to village. The fame spread because it was God walking on the shores of Galilee. We talked about it last week. The authorities found him to be a threat, so they set out to eliminate him. Took him a while. They finally found a traitor. Don't be a traitor. Stand up for Christ. Don't be a traitor. Don't be a Judas. He was falsely accused and mocked and scourged and and beaten. And he walked to a place called Calvary. And only later did they really understand who he was. They knew his name was Jesus, but only later did they realize that he was the change in the status quo, that he was the son of God, that he was the, the man that God had sent in flesh to show who God really was. For six hours, he hung on the cross. And at the end, suffering excruciating pain, he bowed his head and died. You know the story, but do you know the man? Do you understand thy kingdom come? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For some people, even the death of God's son is not enough. And if that's not enough for you, I don't have any other answers. If you don't get this, I mean, nothing will make any difference. If if God would not hold his only begotten, the most precious gift he had back to give you life. Is there any doubt that he won't hold anything else back from you that you need? Can you believe that kind of God? I mean, look to the cross, gaze on the son of God, see, see him, ponder the meaning of Golgotha. What does it really mean? Who is this man that was crucified on the tree? Is he truly the son of God? And even the Roman soldier said, yes, he is the son of God. Name is Jesus. Study his face. Let God show you the wounds in his hand and his feet and his side. It was for you that he died. It was for me that he died. Do you still doubt that God loves you and that he has a place for you in his kingdom and that the kingdom wants to live in your heart? Thy will be done in me as it is in heaven. So be it done here on earth through me. Jesus is exhibit A of what it costs to truly say thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. If you're not willing to do that, then I don't have anything else for you. Listen, it's time, folks. Praying your will be done is an act of God-ordained rebellion. It is. I mean, you just say, I'm going to rebel against everything that I know. I'm going to rebel against everything that I've seen. I'm going to rebel against everything in this world, and I'm going to give my heart to Christ. It's a rebellion against the world, and it's acceptance of who God is. (laughs) Praise God. Are you a kingdom person? Kingdom person? Hallelujah. Well, if you want to find out all the exciting adventures... (laughs) If you're not a kingdom person, it's time to be that. Stand on your feet. I want you to pray with me. I want us to pray that God's kingdom comes in us. There's any of you here this morning who uh, hasn't ever met Jesus. This is your opportunity. I I want you to know that he wants you to be a kingdom person. He wants you to know who he is. He wants you to have a personal relationship with him. If you're watching, wherever you're watching on the internet today, let me say to you, you can pray this prayer with us as well. Become a kingdom person. Allow Jesus Christ to come into your heart and take away your sin and change your life. This is God's opportunity to get to know you, for who you are, for what God wants you to be. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray today that your kingdom come in us. Would you say that with me? Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, Jesus, I pray pray your kingdom kingdom would come in me, me. that your will be done in me me. as as it is in heaven. Now, I know that life is full of distractions, you see. I know that there are things that pull you away from God. But right now, Lord, we we want you to know that we revere and hallow your name. Right now, we want you to know that, that 
We want you in our hearts. We want to learn your heart. We want to know what ignites your passion so that it will also ignite us. God, we want to know you more. Father, I pray that as this group of people stands here, that, that you show us your purposes. That you, you let us know what it is that you want for us. Come in us today, kingdom of God. Now, we desire an invasion of heaven right now. Anybody here desire an invasion of heaven into your heart and your life? Not my will any longer. You want to pray that prayer with me? Lord, not my will any longer. Your will be done in me. Right now, today, in this place, I give you my past. I give you my present. I give you my future. Thank you, Lord. I receive you in a new way in my life right now. Kingdom of God, live in me. Your will be done. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.